So hi everyone from Greece and the Standard Club office in Bulliagmeni. My name is Eva Kelesidou. I am a senior claims handler of the Standard PNI Club and I am a member also of the club's alternative fuel working group representing Greece. Today we will discuss on spillage response involving ammonia, hydrogen and methanol as alternative marine fuels. Joining me for this is ITOP's technical advisor, Andrew Lemazrie, who is an environmental scientist in, with history in contaminated uh, land assessment, and he is currently heading up the developments uh, with regards to alternative fuels at ITOP. Andrew is also a valuable member of the club's alternative fuel advisory panel. Andrew, it is a great pleasure to have you with me today, and thank you very much for sharing your expertise and ITOP's uh, insights. So, Andrew, in our previous discussion, we covered the low carbon breaching fuels, such as biofuels and LNG, which are the most commercially mature alternative marine fuels. As shipping industry is looking for low carbon future fuels in order to meet the requirements of the environmental regulations and the IMO targets, there is an increasing interest around the use of ammonia and hydrogen as a potential alternative marine fuel. The key question though is, Andrew, whether those will behave in the same way as biofuels and LNG. What are your views? Well, first of all, hydrogen um, behaves in a, in a similar way to LNG as both hydrogen and methane, which is the main constituent of LNG, are both very volatile and uh, flammable gases with sort of similar fate and behaviours. Now, it's worth noting that similarly to LNG, um, as hydrogen is a gas at ambient conditions, um, it therefore has to be stored cryogenically. However, due to hydrogen's boiling point being a lot lower than um, that of methane, it means that storage and handling has to occur at even lower temperatures at about minus 250 degrees Celsius, which um, can provide a host of challenges. Now, when hydrogen is spilled, like LNG, there'd be a process of rapid boiling as the hydrogen's temperature increases to ambient conditions. And at this time, a large cloud um, is likely to form in the immediate vicinity, which quickly diffuses into the atmosphere. Now, as hydrogen is lighter and more volatile than LNG, it will rise and disperse more rapidly, leading to a smaller um, sea surface footprint and flammability area than that of LNG. Now, although hydrogen is non-toxic, it has a an extremely large flammability range um, of between 4 and 74% of volume in air, which is quite significant. Uh, B has the capability of replacing oxygen in the air, similar to LNG, at high concentrations, which could potentially lead to asphyxiation, which has risks to seafarers and responders. And C, um, it has the potential, if released, to cause cryogenic damage to the vessel, which could potentially lead to hull failure and, um, and, and loss of the vessel. Now, ammonia, on the other hand, um, I mean, although it is also a gas at ambient conditions, has a boiling point of minus 33 degrees and is therefore typically stored as a pressurised liquid. So it doesn't need to be stored cryogenically. Now, when ammonia is spilled above the waterline, a dense toxic cloud would subsequently form, which can have obvious significant human health impacts for those on the vessel, but also those potentially downwind, downwind of the plume. Uh, this cloud would then dissipate through diffusion in the atmosphere um, ammonia's odour threshold is very low at about five parts per million, whereas levels at which acute sort of harmful effects uh, occur are about 5,000 parts per million. So um, the smell provides a, a good warning system as to, um, as to if there is a spill or a leak, and it allows then a quick response. Um, although ammonia is flammable, it's difficult to ignite, um, and this fact causes the toxic characteristics of ammonia to be the sort of main um, concern when it comes to spill response. Um, now, if ammonia were to be released below the waterline, it would react with water um, to form a soluble ammonium hydroxide, which will um, is, is sort of caustic, and the plume will again dissipate through diffusion into the sea. 
um, as with dispersion of um, of the sort of the cloud, um, the dispersion rate of the plume depends on the met oceanic uh, meteo oceanic conditions. And so, if it has, if it's in a rough sea state or it's got high winds, um, then it'll uh, sort of disperse more. Um, importantly, um, ammonia hydroxide is, um, as I say, chemically basic, which causes it to be corrosive. And so the hazards involved with that are chemical burns and potential impacts to aquatic life, um, which are likely to be near the source of the release and become sort of less likely as, as the distance increases from the casualty. Um, now, to monitor and evaluate this um, this plume or this sort of substance, um, UAVs potentially could be equipped or ROVs with hydrogen or ammonia detection capabilities um, for these gaseous fuel types. Methanol has also been mentioned as a front runner to reduce shipping shipping's carbon footprint with its to toxicity though in mind and the colorless characteristics how do you expect a spill of this substance to unfold so one uh, benefit of methanol is that it's been shipped globally as cargo for more than 100 years as it has many industrial uses such as solvent chemical reagent and also uses antifreeze this is obviously beneficial as there's extensive experience with loading and unloading at port, uh, which is relatively uncomplicated in comparison to ammonia as it's uh, liquid um, at ambient temperatures. And so bunkering is considered very similar to, to bunkering of uh, distillate fuels. However, one downside of methanol is that it's volatile with a low flash point of 11 degrees Celsius compared to the flash point of 6 degrees Celsius for marine diesel oil. This low flash point means that it doesn't meet the minimum 60 degrees um, flash point permitted under SOLAS, and therefore methanol fuel vessels have to meet the mandatory criteria in the IGF code, which are requirements that minimize the risk to the ship, its crew and the environment. Another reason to be careful during storage and handling is that it uh, has a wide flammability range between six and 36%. Unlike the other fuels we've discussed during the webinar series, methanol is a lot more chemically similar to water, which has implications when it comes to detection and response. Now, when it comes to a spill similarly to ammonia, methanol is miscible in water and will therefore rapidly spread with the plume being broken down by dilution, evaporation and biodegradation. Uh, due to this rapid spreading and mixing, it's likely that if spilled in the open ocean by the time that um, the response is able to be mounted, then it may have naturally attenuated by then. However, if a large spill had taken place in a low energy environment with minimal mixing and resources available, a response may be mounted. However, detection of the plume, as you say, it's, it's colorless, so it's very difficult to detect, um, especially even with radar techniques not being useful due to the fact that the waves aren't dampened like, like, um, like oil dampens waves. However, UV detection and fluorescent techniques may be useful. Another approach may be using absorbent materials that are capable of separating alcohol from water. However, that's going to be very difficult, uh, very different from the absorbent materials that we see for oil at the moment and may not have the, um, the same efficiency. Um, also, as you've mentioned, as, as methanol is toxic, there are also risks to human health uh, and potentially marine organisms in the, in the vicinity of the area. So this is their um, risk management profile. Would claims arising from those fuels be most probably similar to LNG? So there would be more focused on short term environmental impact to the local marine life, to the air, and most probably in case of a fire or explosion, we will have potential loss of life and property damage. Uh, most likely for 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 um, for ammonia and hydrogen um, and methanol, because methanol is is highly flammable, so there is uh, potential risk to um, property damage and loss of life. Um, yeah, all, all those substances, all those sort of gaseous substances as well as methanol, do um, are quite volatile in nature, and so may lead to a fire and explosion. We had an incident involving uh, methanol uh, in Malaysia and there were claims of property damage um, from nearby the explosion when the vessel um, suffered an explosion and so that is something to take into account uh, and also 
the fact that um, for, for the toxic substances, then yes, loss of life is, is a very important um, claim type that we may, may be seeing in the future. So, I mean, one instance that I'm sure is fresh in people's mind was the incident in, in a carbon port in Jordan um, early this year where there was a machinery fault. 12 people are dead tonight after a massive explosion and toxic gas leak at a Jordanian port. According to the Jordanian government, a crane was loading chlorine tanks onto a ship when one of them was dropped as a result of a crane malfunction. Video independently verified by NBC News shows the moment a cloud of yellow gas spread to cover the dock, sending workers running for their lives. Now it was just one tank, so um, although chlorine gas is more, more toxic than ammonia gas, it still shows the sort of um, significant risk that there is during bunkering or or if an incident were to take place and, and this gas were to be released. So, yeah, you may you may be seeing um, very short term sort of trends when it comes to claims, but um, quite catastrophic and significant. But you're not going to be seeing a long protracted response like you would for an oil spill, for instance. Thank you, Andrew. I want to take advantage uh, of uh, having you here with us today and just for a while move slightly away from the topic and from ammonia, hydrogen and methanol as alternative fuels. I wonder what are your thoughts um, about the use of batteries and nuclear power? Both have attracted supporters in the market, but others have raised concerns associated with their use on board the ships. Yeah, those are those are two, two fuel types, one one being more advanced than the other. I mean, nuclear, um, we we haven't um, sort of seen much. Um, we've heard of interest, but we haven't seen any sort of significant pilot studies being undertaken um, because of obvious concerns for safety. Um, but for 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 batteries, I mean, there are there are quite a few vessels running on a hybrid mix of diesel and batteries at the moment, um, with more than 400 more on the order books, according to DNV. Um, however, these tend to be much smaller vessels going short distances, for instance, um, sort of domestic ferries. And the 400 vessels um, that are on the order books only equate to 0.02% of the total GT of, uh, of ships on order at the moment. Now, the envir environmental risks of battery are not that well known. But we do know that they contain sort of flammable um, components, liquid electrolytes that can ignite and produce sparks when damaged or overcharged um, and can rapidly burn, potentially igniting other batteries in close proximity. And so, I mean, we've seen some um, sort of fires in the in the shipping industry recently and some of the cargo have been um, sort of lithium ion batteries that when ignited can can spread um, quite significantly so there's a quite a large risk of fire um, and then when these incidents occur there is a large risk to responders as well as hazardous gases are given off from from burning batteries so that needs to be taken into account um, now when the main concern with batteries interacting with the marine environment is that they contain a whole host of um, different sort of metals um, within them and, and if a vessel were to sink with batteries remaining on board there could be potential sort of heavy metal leaching, pollution and accumulation in nearby marine organisms. Um, if this were to happen in the open ocean then potentially the buffering capacity of the sea may mean that environment, Im environmental impacts are reduced uh, in comparison to if it were located in a, in a sheltered bay or port for instance. Now for nuclear power um, there has been an increasing interest recently, for example, using molten salt uh, reactor technology um, on board ships. However, the use of these technologies needs to be developed um, and operated uh, onshore before sort of sufficient experience can be um, available to guide sort of public perception and risks um, from taking it on board ships. Now, it would be expected that vessels containing these technologies um, would ensure that protection of the reactors um, and the sort of radioactive material would be um, paramount and that the design would mean that um, it would be resistant to corrosion if a vessel were to sink, for instance, in deep waters. Um, but the, obviously the best laid plans and, and all that. So if a catastrophic incident were to occur, you may expect to see potentially elevated concentration of, of radionuclides in the vicinity and possibly an, an exclusion zone, which could have implications for respondents and salvers, but it's very much the, the design stage at the moment. And so we haven't 
we haven't seen any instances um, containing those substances as of yet. With all those thoughts in mind, I wonder how you see shipping and marine casualty industry developing in the future. Uh, well, despite increasing regulations um, on greenhouse gas emissions, we know that oil is going to is going to be around for for many many years to come, and so we're not going to see a sort of instant um, change to these alternative fuels, and so we'll still be responding to to oil spills um, sort of long into the future. Um, however, as we discussed in the last webinar, LNG and biofuels seem to be the leading the way currently um, in technology as it's as sort of their industry is more mature. Um, however, uh, I mean biofuels, for instance, can be can be used as a drop in fuel in current engines with minimal sort of um, reconfigurations necessary. And we're seeing trials and bunkering initiatives um, going on globally at the moment with with one notably occurring in Singapore. Uh, and then you have more than 50 percent of all alternatively fueled vessels um, being LNG at the moment, um, which creates about more than 500 in 2022. And so um, we're going to be seeing those those as maybe the initial front runners, um, and then methanol and, and LPG as well, and the first hydrogen fueled um, new builds are, are sort of coming into it. Um, and according to DNB's estimates, um, ammonia and hydrogen um, on board will uh, be available sort of in the in the next sort of four to eight years, and so it'll be interesting to see what what comes of that. Um, but I think generally. Um, future of shipping is going to be a lot of different fuel choices and it's going to be as to what the ship owner decides. Taking in mind that we have already uh, in the water uh, ships uh, fueled by methanol and soon we will have, a, we will have uh, ships uh, fueled with um, ammonia or hydrogen. I wonder if ITOP is able to respond in a potential spillage or what steps you are taking uh, within ITOP uh, so that you are ready uh, and prepared for potential spills of those substances in the future? Yeah, so I mean, over our 54 year history, um, ITOP has adapted to the changing maritime industry. So we initially started out administering a tanker owner voluntary pollution agreement. Um, we then provided, um, started providing 24-7 technical advice to tanker owners in the 70s and then uh, extended our services to non-tankers in the 90s. And so we've um, recently seen an increased number of instances containing H&S, containerized cargo, nurdles um, and coal, for instance. And so the next logical step for, for the organisation is to, is to develop our knowledge with these alternative fuel types as they are coming and unfortunately with an increase in uptake there will inevitably be incidences um, involving them in the future. Um, I mean within ITOPF we have an internal new developments research group that are investigating the fate, behaviour and environmental impacts of these fuel types in the marine environment um, and then externally we're also working with other organisations to increase our preparedness in the future. A good example being um, Standard Club's Alternative Fuel Advisory Panel which is a great forum for discussing the challenges and searching for solutions to these issues the industry is going to face in the future. So all in all, we're just making sure that we're suitably prepared and in the best position to provide um, advice to our members and associates when it comes to these cases of these types. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your experience, Andrew, and for sharing with our viewers today um, ITOP's perspective uh, on this topic. It has been a great pleasure and I'm sure it's going to be interesting uh, to our viewers. Now, continuing uh, the focus on ammonia as an alternative marine fuel, look out for our upcoming alongside podcast episode to be held by my colleague David Roberts. David is the managing director of Standard Asia, a dynamic leader and innovative mind who will be speaking to the CEO of the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization, Lin Lu, about their ammonia bunkering project. Thank you for watching and have a lovely day. Goodbye. <music>